Okay. Gosh, you know, I uh, want to give you a special welcome, and I think our cup overfloweth with reasons to be here this morning. It's so exciting, and uh, I'm going to just go ahead and let it unfold. I'll leave it at that for now, but lots of great reasons to be here this morning. You know, if you're new with us, we want to give you a special welcome. In fact, we have a, a gift. Uh, it should be over on one of the little round tables. It's a special gift in my book because it's a coffee card, and I happen to be a real coffee lover. So, uh, And if you haven't done so, uh, there are Connect cards over there. That you can fill out and be connected to the church, uh, or you can text the church at uh, 3003099. Did I get that right, Pastor? Thank you. 253, of course, of course. And, uh, you know, we should have, I don't know if you've noticed the wonderful artwork that's around connected to Vacation Bible School, but we wanted to give a shout out to Mr. Tony Lawson, the multi-talented Tony. Gosh, Tony, I mean, I think we've seen Tony play Abe, uh, you know, Moses, uh, he sings, Martin Luther, uh, he sings, he, he uh, what else? There's no end. There's no end, Tony. Great job. But the artwork is uh, wonderful. And I, is Kathy Spurrell here? Is oh, there's Kathy. I think Kathy's going to have something special for us, too. You want me to hold this? Sure, that would be lovely. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So it's almost Christmas, isn't it? Doesn't it feel like it? <laughs> it may not be almost Christmas, but it is almost time to be filling, <laughs> to be filling our um, Samaritan's Purse <laughs> Operation... Christmas child. I always want to say Operation Cookie Drop because the Girl Scout in me always knew. So, um, so we're going to be getting 200 of these boxes, the pre-printed ones. But then this box, so it's a, just a regular shoe box, we really want to start collecting those as well. So if anybody you know is doing school shopping, you know, shoes for kids or for adults or whatever, bring us all of your empty boxes if you have them because I know that we can fill more than 200 boxes. I, you know, so, um, and then also there's some great sales out there for back to school items, you know, pens, pencils, markers, fun things. There's summer clearance, like little beach balls that the kids could have, you know, it's when we generally, when we start thinking about this, it's October. And so we put a bunch of hats and mittens and scarves, which are fine, but these are going to hot areas of the world. <laughs> so I think it'd be really cool if we all just sort of kept our eyes peeled for really great deals. You can there's five ways you can help with this project. You can fill a box. You can fill a box online. You can donate money. You can buy things in bulk, like 20 little beach balls or something, and then we'll make the balls. And the fifth is the most important, I think, and everybody can do this, is if you just start praying for these boxes now, and we're gonna start filling them in October. So that's the real big push, and then they get sent off in November. Um, and this is our third year, I think, doing it, but praying for them, for, for God to just do big, big things through this church and through these boxes for kids all around the world. So that's my spiel until next time I say it again. So start saving boxes and getting stuff for the kids. Thank you, Kathy. How, m how many of you knew that this month is baptism month here at Emmanuel? Anybody? Some? Yeah. Awesome. I get excited. For, for baptism, uh, and it being baptism month, of course, that means if you have not been baptized, this is a great time uh, to think about doing so. But also, if you have been baptized, this is a great time to be reminded of our baptism, which is so important. And one of the many things that, that I believe is special about baptisms, and I love to be even just in attendance, is that we all get to relive the new life that we have through Christ Jesus in our baptism. And all of us, it's a very much a community um, event. So, you know, as I was asked to sort of lead into worship this morning, and then, uh, and then I, uh, I thought about, you know, some kind of a scripture to, to lead into worship, the uh, baptism and, and a call to worship go together. And what comes to my mind for worship and baptism is, is uh, believe it or not, Psalm 23. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I just love that psalm, and I love uh, that, how that psalm uh, speaks uh, both to baptism and to worship. 
And you know, um, I heard just yesterday someone say that due to the circumstances in life, some people never experience hope because they don't know what it looks like. They've never seen hope. And I believe that's true. And it grieves me. It grieved me when I heard it. And uh, one of the things I thought about is that I wished that they could read the Psalms. Because if they could read the Psalms, they would see hope. And uh, so I, uh, sometimes I also get asked, you know, how many Psalms do you read a day? And I read one Psalm a day. But I immerse myself in it and I get help. My favorite commentator for, for the Psalms is a gentleman by the name of Clinton McCann. And he's, he spoke to me with some things in Psalm 23 that I'll never forget. Uh, a couple of those, and you'll, you're, you're familiar with the, the verse, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Does that sound familiar? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Well, what McCann points out is that the Hebrew behind that word follow Follow is not the best translation of that Hebrew. The better translation is pursue. So it would be more accurate to say, surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. And that is also very powerful if you think about those words, goodness and mercy. Because when the psalmist says goodness and mercy, the Hebrew uh, that's behind those two words, those are not lofty ideals or vague concepts. Goodness and mercy refers to the Lord. Goodness and mercy is how the Lord described himself back in Exodus 33 and 34 to Moses. So when the psalmist says, surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life, the Lord is pursuing you. And so when you heed to that call of baptism, you are heeding to that call of the one who is pursuing you, the goodness and mercy who is pursuing you. And if you've been baptized, then that same call is still with us all. It's still with us all because we know who our shepherd is. The Lord is my shepherd, and we have new life in him. So with that, let's rise and sing. darkness closes in on every side when battles raging when the waters rise 
I fear no evil for I know the truth Nothing can separate my heart from you Cause there's no weapon stronger than your love There's no weapon stronger than your love No height, no depth can overcome Cause there's no weapon stronger everything, knower of everything. You know us down to every hair on our head, every cell in our body, God. We pray for your power and peace that passes all understanding today, God. God, you are goodness. You aren't just good. You are goodness. That is who you are. It's a quality of you, God. I pray that your goodness, peace, power, everything that is you would flow through us today, God that we can worship you with all that we have. And it's in your holy and precious and beautiful name that we pray. Amen. All right, this next one is called This I Believe. Um, it is a shout of proclamation of who God is and his promise to us. So sing this with everything that you've got, for this is what we believe in this community. This is what we believe as followers of the one who saved us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, 
Son, Jesus our Savior. Sing, I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is talk about our wonderful week of VBS and how it went is Lainey, my sweet wife. <laughs> Hi, Emmanuel. You guys are more than welcome to sit down. Um, this week we had a great VBS. We had over 40 kids, which is such an answer to prayer. And our bottom line for the week was confidence, learning to see yourself the way God sees you. And so they're going to practice some of that confidence by coming up in front of all of you. And they learned about Jesus all this week. So they're going to tell, they're going to sing you a song where they tell you about the Jesus that they've learned about all week. So I'll invite my VBSers up. Come on, guys. 
Oh, if you want to sing along, um, the lyrics are on your chair, but please stay seated so their parents can see them. They're not <laughs> as tall as you guys. <laughs> Behind the microphones. Yeah, right on that white line. See the white line right there? There you go. All right. All righty. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Here we go, guys. can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear oh come on let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who can work it all out for good oh let me tell you about my Jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty Who would take my cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty? Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Here we go. On, he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free. The good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, come on, sing it out, hallelujah, amen, amen, Woo great job, guys, let's give another round of applause for these VBS kids, Woohoo! Alrighty, you're good to go. <laughs> good morning, everyone. That's a tough act to follow, isn't it? Holy smokes, that was awesome. Think about what just happened. Your kids, the kids of our church, stood before you all, their, 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 their moms, dads, friends, neighbors, 
and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and, and told you about their Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And that is just amazing that, that, that we could have that here at, our, here at our church. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit is with us. It's a sign that God's presence is here. And it's the, I love the last section of that song or the, the refrain where it says, um, and the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Did you see the kids point at themselves? So let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. All right. Talking about a changed life, we're, uh, we're going to be uh, in Acts chapter 22. I printed it out for you. It's on your seat there. And as, you, if you mentioned, as I mentioned last week, this is Paul returning back to Jerusalem knowing that he's coming near the end. This has been a long tumultuous but successful and faithful life that's that was lived for God and it's he's returning to Jerusalem and it's coming near the end he's warned not to go back he knows he's going into the teeth of the enemy he's no he's he's going into the the lion's lion's den he knows that I mean many of us would be a little bit loath to go into the lion's den if we knew we were going into it sometimes we just end up in danger and it's fearful he knew it was dangerous and he knew it was probably going to be his end and he went anyway, which sounds a lot like who? Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? So what happens, you know, my teacher, Jim Nestigan at seminary was used to say, when you start to get close to Jesus Christ, huh? when you start to get close, or when he starts to get close, I should say, the cross is never far behind. Hmm. The cross is never far behind. That notion that you start to, you start to lose yourself. What did Jesus do? He, he lost himself for the sake of, for the sake of the world and for the sake of our salvation. And when you get start to get close to him, you start to look like him. You start to lose yourself. You start to give yourself away for him. Gosh, last week we were all sweating and now we're kind of cold, huh? So we're going to be in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 22, and it's really cool. You're going to get what you're going to read about what uh, Paul's testimony. Now, we do testimonies here, but Paul's going to do his testimony in the lion's den, not to a, a group of applauding b brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to get his testimony. And, uh, you know, I was looking this up. Uh, the book of Acts is 28 chapters, and Paul tells his testimony often in the book of Acts. And check out this little interesting fact. Anyone, can you guess how many words the average human speaks per day? Well, here, here. For, for, me, for men... And it's quite different as you break it down gender. For men, it's about 6,000, which equals about a 25-page essay. So that's a, that's a lot of talking. Women, 10 to 20,000. You jabber boxes. However, both <laughs> however, both genders average about 500 words of actual value. <laughs> I got this from the book... Um, it's uh, the, the book is called uh, Men Are Pigs, But Fortunately Women Like Pork. <laughs> but this means that of the 700 words that are actually spoken, and we speak thousands per day, this means the study says la that ladies add a great deal of filler to their conversation. Um, and men, you know, probably should be speaking a little bit more from their heart. But... If Paul's, my point is, is like, if Paul, if you see in the book of Acts, if you hear his testimony three times, that means he probably told it 3,000 times. So it's condensed in, the, you're getting 30 years of ministry condensed in these 28 chapters. If you get his testimony like two or three times throughout the, throughout the book of Acts, that means you're, he's, every person he goes to, it's, it's going back to his testimony. And so here's what happens. Let's backtrack the story. He goes to Jerusalem. And Paul's been going from uh, out into the Mediterranean world, con converting Gentiles, and he finally gets identified in Jerusalem. And there's a group of religious leaders say, here's this guy who has defiled our law and has defiled our temple by bringing Gentiles into it. So they were very racist against Gentiles, and they were not supposed to come into the, the Jewish spaces. And what does the gospel do? It's, it's, it's hard not to talk about this every week because the book of Acts addresses it every week, how the gospel breaks down all racial barriers. How there, actually, there are no racial barriers in the gospel. Paul would say in Galatians 3, what? There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, because we're all saved by the same blood of Jesus on the cross. And it's, it's us, it's us and our sin that erect these 
racial barriers or social barriers that, 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 that segregate. That's us that does that. That's which consequently would be the absolute opposite of what happens throughout the book of Acts. As the gospel levels everyone that we're all sin- sinners and elevates everyone at the same that we're all saints in Jesus. So you can't, you can't look down on another race or another gender or someone who's different than you. If they're in Christ, there's nothing to look down on. Who are you? If Jesus had to spill his blood to save you from, from, from the pit that we had climbed in ourselves and in complete darkness and we are helpless and cannot help ourselves and God elevates us and lifts us through the precious blood of Christ, you think you're pretty sweet? See how the gospel humbles you? It humbles you into the dirt. If you're a little bit too full of yourself, God's going to come to you and say, yeah, who do you really think you are? Do you know what I had to do for you? You're not as sweet as you think you are. And, and that's anathema in the modern culture, especially in, in 21st century America. It's all about self-esteem and feeling better about yourself. And the gospel says, you know, the problem with you isn't your lack of self-esteem. Your problem is too much self-esteem. <laughs> you think too highly of yourself. But then what does it do? It humbles you into the dirt. But then what does the gospel of Jesus do? But he died for you. You're that much loved. You're that much valued. And it elevates you to the sky. Nothing else in the entire world can do that at the same time, the way the gospel of Jesus Christ does. If you take anything else, any other philosophy or any idol in life, be it romance or career, and you el- you're either going to feel so good about yourself because you're successful and look down on other people, or you're going to beat yourself up and say, I suck, I suck, I am never any good. You're going to end up in one of two places. Either, either prideful, I could do it, why can't you, loser? Or, I can never do it, and I'm never going to be able to do it, and I'm terrible. You're going to end up in one of those two places, because anything other than the gospel is based on you and your performance. I was going to read this later, but I might as well do it now. How many of you remember the, the gymnast, uh, Sean Johnson? Do you remember her? She won gold medal in Beijing, but in her actual event that she wanted to win, she took the silver medal. And uh, she says when she was, uh, this is in, you could, you could uh, go check it out on YouTube. It's called I Am Second. And she's not referring to her silver medal. She's talking about she's always, the true fulfillment was found being second to Jesus Christ. Hmm? Not on a silver medal podium. She says, uh, listen to this, you guys. She goes, I remember being given the silver medal on the podium, Johnson recalled. The person who did it gave me a hug. Listen to this now. The person who did it, who gave me the silver medal, gave me a hug and said, I'm sorry. It was kind of like a validation in my heart that I had failed. I felt like I had failed the world, my country. I felt like since the world saw me as nothing else than a gymnast, if I failed at that, I failed as a human being. She ended up getting a gold later on in those Olympics, but the 2008 Beijing Olympics, she says, but the damage had already been done. Hmm. I remember she, and then she talks about being on dance, dancing with the stars. Do any of you remember her? Uh, and she was successful there too, but she wanted to make a comeback. She said, she quote, she goes, I was a muscular petite gymnast St- on the stage of dancing with the stars. I'm next to supermodels. So I've, I fell victim to image comparison with them now. Not just performance as a gymnast, but now image comparison to these, these beautiful ladies that are on the stage of dancing, dancing with the stars with her. Six months before the 2012 London Olympic trials, Johnson said she hit an all-time low. She was training, working out 40 hours a week. You guys, some of us can't even get 40 minutes. 40 hours a week trying to lose weight for the approval of her family supporters. She said, but then it happened. It was one of those moments that's really hard to explain and really hard for a lot of people to understand. But in that one moment, I felt God talking to me. And he said, Sean, you've been so distraught over trying to prepare for the Olympics again. You're afraid of disappointing a lot of people and not being yourself. But it's okay to follow me and put that all behind you. Hmm? In that instant, she said, I felt the entire world was just lifted off my shoulders. Because that's what Jesus does, huh? He's a burden lifter. 
She retired from competitive gymnastics in June 2012. She got married, and she concludes this way. God is the answer to everything. Jesus is the answer to everything. And Jesus sacrificed everything on the cross so that when I stood up there and was given that gold medal, yes, it's a monumental and amazing experience and a wonderful thing, but it's not the end all be all. He will always be my greatest award and my proudest medal. Therefore, she says, I am second. You see what the gospel can do? There's a real life example of how he could lift the burdens. You know, I have a Harley. I just haven't ridden it in a while. Um, it doesn't make that much noise, but here's Paul. He comes into Jerusalem. They recognize him. He's been preaching the gospel. This that lifted Sean Johnson's burden is exactly what these people hated. A riot breaks out. They grab Paul. The rioters come around him and they start to beat the living hell out of him. And it gets so bad that the Roman commander is informed that a riot is breaking out, that the Roman soldiers have to come in to break up the crowd and grab Paul and carry him away, beaten and bruised and just knocked every, every which way. Now here's, here's, here's what's interesting. Um, C.S. Lewis said, of all the bad men in the world, religious, bad religious men are the worst. They're the absolute worst. You know why he says? Because they do it with the approval of their conscience. Does that make sense? We're doing this for God. Do you see, isn't it amazing though how loused up we could get in our relationship with God and our thoughts about God that by the messengers that God actually sends, we reject and we beat them up and want to kill them? Do you see, do you see the situation how we could get ourselves in? This is what, and realize this, you guys, this is what the gospel will engender when we are faithful and when we proclaim and when we share Jesus in this community, it will engender opposition, possibly violence. And this is why we are severely lacking today in our culture exactly what the apostle Paul has that we don't have. And you're going to see courage on the stand here today. We live in a time of fear. Anyone question that? No, of course. And there's lots of things to be fearful about. I mean, there's, vi there's all sorts of stuff to be fearful about. And given the way we look at news and get our information, it just, that, that just aggravates it now. My theory is because there's so many different places where you could get news now that a lot of the main news networks have to sensationalize everything just to keep up. And you don't know who to trust. Are you guys with me? You don't know who to trust anymore. You, you don't know when you're getting propagandized. I'm talking on all sides. You don't know who to trust and therefore you get fearful about the future and what's going to happen. My recommendation, do you want a, a spiritual recommendation? Go turn your news off for two weeks and see what happens. And read your Bible instead and your head is going to start to lift. You're going to say, well, look at, God is in charge. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus is in, Jesus is in control. Jesus is in charge. Jesus is, is, is seated on the throne. Not CNN, not Newsmax, you know, they're not in control. God is in control. And he's going to set my mood and my narrative and my outlook on this world. But that, it, that takes courage, my friends. Great courage. And when you get gospel courage, it's going to look just like this. Watch the Apostle Paul now here in Acts 22. They, he, what, he, what Paul does is he says, can I go on the stand and talk to these people? He's going to go talk to the rioters now. And so in chapter 22, you have that there. Uh, verse 1, he says, Brothers and, si brothers and father fathers, listen to my defense. When they heard him speak in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Do you know why? Aramaic. Well, they spoke Aramaic, but when the, the Jews would come back from the diaspora, you know, spread out throughout the Mediterranean world, some spoke Latin, some spoke Greek. Some so, so when they'd come back to Jerusalem, they, they would all speak one language so they could understand each other, which was Aramaic. When he spoke in Aramaic, they became quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I stundered under uh, Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. Gamaliel wasn't just some normal rabbi. This was the Albert Einstein 
rabbis. So if you're trained by him, you are an elite among the elite of religious authorities. Paul studied under Gamaliel. Paul is brilliant. You could just go read his letters and you could see that this man is extremely educated and extremely bright. The atheist uh, philosopher, Anthony Flew, who actually died as a theist, but when he was an atheist, he says, just go read the book of Romans and you could see that the apostle Paul is a first rate intellectual. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council themselves can can testify. I obtained letters from them and their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul didn't just, (laughs) some people, do you have friends that hate Christians and hate Christianity? He didn't just hate Christians. He was killing them. I mean, it's one thing to like, oh, Christianity. It's another to want to, it, to actually engender their death and to arrest them and murder them. Can you imagine when Paul was converted, and he's going to talk about it right now, how that must have felt to come into the community of these believers who he had just probably brought to death their friends, their brothers, their sisters, their moms, their dads? You know how embarrassing that probably was? You're going to see how cool the gospel is here in a second, though. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Notice what Jesus says. Paul was persecuting Jesus' followers, but notice what he says. Why are you persecuting me? Because any persecution of of Jesus' followers is a persecution of him. And he says, you're persecuting me. When you go after Christians, when you go after my followers, you're not just going after them, you're going after me. Maybe we'll see that more in today's culture. Who knows? I mean, in other countries, this is happening where churches are under such strict regulation and attack and pastors are getting arrested for holding services. Who are you, Lord? Verse eight. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting, dummy. He replied, my companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked, get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you'll be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand in Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Now, mind you, Paul's talking about all of this in the lion's den, in the midst of trouble. I want to conclude, we're going to conclude in a second, but I want to finish the story. We're going to conclude with how do you get this courage? How do you get this courage at work? How do you get this, this courage in a relationship? Modern culture is just going to say, what's the, the old, uh, it was, it was a quote by Will Smith in a movie. Um, I think I even have it written, written down. It's really interesting because it's a typifies our modern culture. Um, Danger is going to come, but fear is optional. Danger is going to come, but fear is optional. In other words, don't be afraid. Buck up. Look within yourself. This is the modern message. Summons up the blood. Be courageous. What does that typically do for you when you're gripped with fear? That just makes it worse. Right? If, you're, if you're trembling, don't be afraid. I'd be like, what, 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 what? it just makes it worse because you have to engender those feelings yourself. Now you're going to see the gospel doesn't say courage is the absence of fear. The gospel says courage is in the midst of fear. If there was no fear, you wouldn't, be, you, you wouldn't need courage. Get rid of your fear. Well, then you don't need courage if there's no fear. And fear could be a healthy thing at times too. I mean, if, fear alerts you to things that could possibly kill you or harm you or damage you. But you could be overfearful too. There's overfear and there's underfear. Underfeared people are going to get themselves killed. Overfeared people are just going to cuddle up in a ball and cry. What's gospel courage look like? Well, you're, you're looking at it. We'll, we'll conclude with that. Hold on. Let's go to chapter, back to chapter 22. Verse 12, a man named Ananias came to me, came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He's a Christian. He stood beside me. And what is the next line, you guys? What are the next two words? This is the guy who had been killing Christians. And when you read Acts chapter 9, Ananias, when he's told to go to Saul, says to God, says to Jesus, you sure? (laughs) 
I want you to go to Ted Bundy. Our, Lord, have you thought this through? So typical Ananias of us. That we happen to know the way our lives should go better than him. And he's not complying. Which is typically how we pray. We have something that we want to accomplish and a goal that we want to achieve. And we'll pull Jesus in to help us. Rather than letting him set the goal... Him set the agenda. Him set your trajectory. And we pray that he will accompany us and give us courage as we achieve what he set before us rather what, what, than what we want for our life. Let Jesus direct what you should be doing with your life. And Ananias, look at, after he says, Lord, are you sure? In Acts 9, do you know what Jesus says to him? Go! This isn't a discussion, Ananias. Because last time I checked, the name before Jesus Christ that I get is called Lord, which means that I am your Lord. I'm, it's like, I remember a number of years ago, Chance goes to me, he goes, you're not the boss of me. I said, as a matter of fact, if I had a job description, that would be exactly what my job would be, would be the boss of you. And you don't want to know why I'm the boss of you? Because you're five, right? And I'm 45. Go, he says to Ananias. So Ananias goes. And when he comes to Saul, this killer of Christians, this one who's probably hated more than anyone in the whole community of believers there in Jerusalem, he goes over to Saul. And what does he do? Brother Saul. <laughs> Barriers broken down that quick? Lives transformed that quick? Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus sent me. Receive your sight. Let's continue. This is in verse 13. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, Jesus told, or uh, Ananias told Paul, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will. Everyone always says, what, what is God's will? What is, I don't know what God's will is. You do know what God's will is. God's will is that you should trust him. You should live in him, live in Jesus with certainty, with peace in your heart, and give your life over to him as, a, as, a, as Jesus did for the world, as a ransom for many. And you give your life over to Jesus Christ and lose, pick up your cross daily and follow him. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But those, Jesus says, for those who lose their life for my sake will find it. That's God's will. And we already know the ending. Christ is risen. And this is what totally transformed Paul. If Christ is risen, you already have the ending and the final victory. You know God's will because you know where the trajectory is going. Even like that song we sang today, No Weapon. I love that song where it says, when darkness closes in on every side, when battles rage and what? And when the waters rise. What does gospel courage then say? I fear no evil for I know the truth. Nothing can separate my heart from you. That's Romans 8. That's why we sing at the end of that song. There's no height, no depth can overcome. There's Romans 8. Because there's no weapon stronger than your love. You say that when darkness closes in on every side. You say that when battles rage and when the waters rise. Say it. You say it out loud. I fear no evil for I know the truth. Don talked about as he opened Psalm 23. What does David say in Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything else. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in right pathways for his namesake. Not for your namesake. His. Even though I walk, what? Through the valley of the shadow of death. What's the next line, church? I fear no evil. I fear no evil. Why? Because I'm so strong? Because I have courage? Because I'm so amazing? Because I have big muscles? I fear no evil for you because you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And what Jesus likes to do is to prepare a table in the presence of enemies. You don't throw a party in the presence of Al-Qaeda. You don't throw a party in the midst of enemies. God does. <laughs> You could throw a party right in the midst of everything that troubles you. That's the power of the gospel. Let's finish up here. Verse 15. He, Jesus says to, uh, well, Ananias from Jesus says to Paul, you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. There's your job description, Emmanuel. 
If you're looking for purpose in this life, if you're looking to change your job, you're looking for some sort of significance or some reason that you should, uh, something that you should be doing or taking a next step if you're having a midlife crisis and you don't want to work in this job or I don't really like her anymore. There's your job description. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. Greek word for witness, martyrion. You will be a martyr, a witness to all that you have seen and heard. And now I love this. Verse 16, Ananias, look at, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. I assume there's some of us out there that haven't been baptized. What are you waiting for? This is the Lord Jesus's words to you today. What are you waiting for? There's going to come a moment, as I talk about almost every Sunday, where your knee is going to bow. When Christ returns, your knee is going to go down whether you acknowledge him as your Lord or not. Because he's, every knee will bow. Do it today. Do it this month. What are you waiting for? Be baptized. Oh, and by the way, this is really interesting. Do you know back in that culture... Um, Gentiles were the only ones, if they wanted to convert to Judaism before Jesus, if they wanted to convert into Judaism, Gentile converts were the only ones that had to be baptized. And you, you, you baptized yourself. It meant washing. You're washing your Gentileness off. I mean, you could even see the racism in that, right? You're washing your whiteness off. You're washing your blackness off so you could be a part of us. That's not what the gospel does at all. <laughs> So the gospel comes along and do you know what, do you know what uh, Ananias, Jesus says to Paul? Think about this, how amazingly crazy this would be. You go to a Jewish Pharisee religious leader and, you say, and say, you're not clean either. Oh yeah, the Gentiles need to be baptized to be Jews. You need it too. Your keeping of your laws, your ritual sacrifices, they don't make you clean. You need to be baptized too. That would have been earth shattering in that time. And furthermore, you don't baptize yourself. Why? You need to be baptized outside of you. God comes from outside of you. This isn't coming from you. This is coming for you. Not from you, but at you and for you. That's why Holy Communion is so beautiful and baptism and the sacraments are so beautiful because it doesn't come from you. There's some of you, there's got to be some of you out there that think, gosh, if I know that if it's up to me in any way, shape, or form in the end, this is why the gospel is so beautiful because I know, Dan Shaw knows, if it's up to me in any way, any possible manner that, that the goodness of, of, of God or salvation has to be left even a little bit on my altar of my heart, I know that it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to sink me. I know that it's lost. And this is why the gospel comes for you and completely his work, the body of Christ given for you. You don't believe it? Here, eat this, huh? You have something tangible in your hand that says Jesus loves you. You can't deny it. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's got your name on it. Verse 17, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. There's a reality to that, you guys. When you're courageous and you're going to share the gospel, you've got to realize that probably the vast majority are not going to want to hear it. The vast majority are going to be hostile. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. Like, hey, I don't know how to do this because I've kind of killed a lot of these people. Now I'm one of them? Verse 20, and when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, do you remember that in Acts 7? Do you remember? Paul was there saying, good, yes, kill Stephen. I stood give, there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So very typical. What is, what is, uh, what's he doing? Remember Moses, when God calls Moses to go free the people of, of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, 
well, I don't know. I don't know your name, and I don't. I, 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 and, 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 and what, what what do I tell Pharaoh? And how do, I don't have anything. And, and I, I, I'm not very eloquent. And I don't excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. So finally, God corners Moses like He wants to corner you. And you know what Moses says? Oh, just send someone else. Hmm. Now Paul is saying, I don't know how this is going to work. Excuses now, right? I'm not righteous. I'm bad. I've, I, 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 my past is my past is past, and, and, and it's, it, how can I go forward with my past like this? And look at what the Lord says, just like he said to Ananias. What, is he, <laughs> what does the Lord say in verse 21? Then the Lord said to me, what? Go. go. Can you just shut up and let me be Lord? Like, just, Gerhard Ferdy, my teacher, always used to say that. If we're speaking 10,000 words a day, there's, there comes a point where the good Lord wants to just say, can you shut up for a second? I am in charge. Shut your mouth. Blip, blip, like I do with the kids. No, 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 no. That's it. Shut up. Go. You're going to go into danger. And look at Eve. It says, go and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Oh, that's comforting. Go and I will send you far away to the people that you've traditionally hated. Far away. Probably to Spain, right? Verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said, th- or until he said this. What was the word that triggered them? These are, these are woke Jews in the first century. What triggered them? They got offended. Huh? What was, what was the word? Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul, verse 22, until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. Just because you're bringing the gospel to the wrong people. That's why I love doing church outside is because I'm hoping the wrong people would wander off the street. You know what I'm saying? I, we, we get lots of homeless around our, our church uh, property here and we're hoping that they will come in off the street. The wrong people that when they walk in, we go, yes, the kind that Jesus loves. Those kind. Gymnast again, you've heard me say this. My teacher, his last words to us before we left seminary, he said, you remember one thing and one thing only, said to our class, our Lutheran confessions class. He goes, Jesus Christ loves sinners. And he's real iffy about you pious folk. Jesus doesn't like the pious and the highbrow and look at me. He doesn't like those people. huh? He likes sinners that are maybe camping around the church and hiding out in our alleyway. Those are the types the ones that have lost all hope. I was hoping one of the guys, you and John invited one to come today. I was hoping he'd come. I tried to convince him. Uh, he said, well, when I t- invited him, he goes, well, I don't know. I go, bro, what do you got to lose at this point? You know, <laughs> what are you waiting for? So look at, rid the earth. He's not fit to live. Rid the earth of him. Verse 23, as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're stinking nuts. What do you mean? They're, they're flinging dust in there. Like they're just wild and uncontrolled out of their minds in their rage and in their zealotry. For what? I said that because Paul says that Gentiles will be saved by our God through Jesus. That's it. The gospel will bring hostility As they were flinging dust in the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated to, uh, to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. Why don't you flog and interrogate them? <laughs> what, you're going to beat the hell out of me because of they're mad at me? So it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And we'll finish up. What happens is Paul says, are you going to flog me? I'm a Roman citizen. And the guy goes, you're a Roman citizen? I had to pay a lot of money for that. Paul says, yeah, I was born one. And so they relent from the beating, but well, they actually stretch him out to flog him. But Paul uses that his citizenship, which he should. And we saw he did that a couple weeks ago. Um, he's then taken to another trial. And for the next three chapters, you know what Paul's going to do in chapter 26. We're going to do it next week. He's going to tell his testimony again. He's going to give it again. And he's going to share it again, right in front of hostility. Once again, can you do that? See the, Gospel courage is not ridding yourself of fear. It's filling your heart with something that gives you courage in the midst of fear, which is Jesus himself, huh? When Jesus is present, there, are, there is fear. 
Of course there's fear, but it doesn't have control. See, for some of you, and I know some of you, fear has control on you. And the gospel, you haven't, your heart isn't properly oriented toward a healthy gospel courage and healthy gospel fear. It's got control. And what does it do? What do things do when they control you? Well, it's dictatorial. It's tyrannical. It, it, it pushes us to make decisions. It pushes us to, it, it, it forces us back in cowering. Won't speak up at our job because they'll run me out. Won't say anything because I don't know how she'll take that. We've been friends for a while and I feel weird about talking about the Lord. Can't pray at the Thanksgiving dinner because Aunt Susie is going to be there and she's not a Christian. She's woke and she'll get offended. That's weak. That's super weak. Does that sound like what I just read? No. That's gospel courage. Courage enough to stand in the midst of hostility and say, let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. (laughs) And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. And Paul does that in Acts 26. He's on trial for being a Christian and do you know what he does for trying to convert people to Christianity? And do you know what he does in the midst of his trial? Tries to convert the king to Christianity. It's like, I, I like to joke, it's like being on trial for murder in the courtroom and you murder someone in the courtroom. It's like, well, uh, because the king even says, you're going to see it next week. Paul, are you, all this learning has made you insane. The king said, he goes, I'm not insane. Huh? And then he says, he says, are you going to have me be a Christian? And Paul says, I would love to have you exactly like me. He says, except for these chains. (laughs) Ha 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 ha. I mean, he does it right in the midst of the assembly. That's gospel courage. It's courage because we know who, who holds the victory. huh? And we know the one who we see. What does it say? He's allowed you to see the righteous one. Ananias says to Paul, we've seen him. We know his will. We know the trajectory is his victory. We got work to do. Gospel-centered work. And there's no need to fear evil because you know the truth. Hmm? Nothing could separate your heart from him. Nothing in all of creation. So let's end with this. I, uh, you want to hear a story of gospel courage? We'll end with this. Don't worry. How many of you know who Charles Spurgeon was? One of the, probably, what would you say? The, probably the greatest preacher of the 19th century. He writes, on January 6th, 1850, 15-year-old Charles Spurgeon was going up to his church when a blizzard prevented him from going further. This is in London. So the blizzard was so bad, he said he turned the corner and made his way into a small primitive Methodist church. (laughs) He He recounted this story hundreds of times. He tells it a little bit differently every time, but this is the gist. He says, I sometimes think, this is Spurgeon now, think I might have been in darkness and despair now had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm that one Sunday morning when I was going to a place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a court and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel for church, there must have been 12 people. The minister could not get to church that, m- that morning because of the blizzard. So a poor man, a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. He picked up his text, which was Isaiah 45, 22, which says this, Look at me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in this text. Here's the sermon. He began. It's not too long. My dear friends, now take this as a sermon for you. My dear friends, this is a very simple Bible passage indeed. What does it tell you to do? Look. Now that does not take a great deal of effort. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It's just look. This isn't an educated preacher, probably an illiterate cobbler. You may be the biggest fool and yet you could look. You don't need to go to college to look. A man need not be worth $1,000 a year to look. Anyone could look. A child can look. But this is what the text says. It says, 
Look unto me, I, he said in broad Essex. Many of ye are looking to yourselves. No use looking there. You'll never find comfort in yourselves. Then the good man followed up his text in this way. Look unto me, says Jesus. I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I am hanging on the cross. Look, I am dead and buried. Look unto me. I rise again. Look unto me. I ascend and I'm sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, look to me. Look to me. When he had gotten about that point, Spurgeon says, and managed to spit out 10 minutes, he was, at length of, he was at the length of his tether. Then he looked at me under the choir loft. And I dare say, with so few present, he knew I was a stranger. He then said, <laughs> this guy looks, young man, under the choir loft, you look very miserable. <laughs> Well, I did, he said, but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made on my personal appearance from the pulpit before. However, the good blow struck. He continued, and you will always be miserable. Miserable in life, miserable in death, if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then he shouted, as only a primitive Methodist can, young man under the choir loft. Look to Jesus Christ. There and then the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled back. And at that moment, I saw the sun. And I could have risen that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ. And that man went on to be one of the most courageous preachers you're ever going to find. You have the precious blood of Christ covering you you go out into this world with gospel-centered courage. Just like the Apostle Paul, just like Charles Spurgeon. Father, we love you, and we thank you that you have, Lord, that your eyes are on us, as we prayed earlier, that we, uh, we're not called just to attend church, we're called to go take our church and go out deployed into the city, Lord. Deployed into this area with the precious blood of Jesus covering us, maybe into the midst of riots, maybe into the midst of getting beat, beat up, maybe into the midst of difficulty, maybe to people that we don't want to bring the gospel to. So Lord, we pray right now, blow us up. Whatever you got to do, Lord, if you got to beat us up to get our minds right, beat us up to get our minds right so that we could stand before adversity and testify, not just have a title as pastor or president or congressman, or Mr. or Mrs., not to have a title, but have a testimony. Give us that courage, Lord, in the midst of our fear. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, now you got the word. There's the gospel. Now you're going to get fed. We have a, we have a chili dog feed today. Um, so we have Jim Neese is world famous, or, right? The, I mean, these aren't just Tacoma famous. These are world famous. Um <laughs> They're talking about them all the way on the other side of the world, you know. So we're going to be serving in the sand center, in the gym in there. So just go on in, grab it. You could sit in there if you want to. If you want to sit in there, make sure you bring, your, bring a chair because all the chairs are here. So if you need a, you need a chair, go ahead and bring it, bring it on in there. There's tables set up and chips and all sorts of good food. So we got a lot of food, so make sure you eat. Eat, Papa. Eat. You know what that's from, right? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And for kiddos, we got, we got face painting that's going to go on in there. I think you should get your face painted, my love. <laughs> your face looks perfect as it is. So um, take notice, guys. Huh? That's how it works. Um, so go, please enjoy. Hang out as long as you want. Um, we just want to celebrate the end of VBS and celebrate what God is doing in our church and kick off our August in a, in a, with some fellowship. By the way, this is the first time I believe that we've had any type of fellowship type meal, breaking bread together in well over two years. We used to do those all the time. If you're new to our church, we used to have meals all the time, probably like 10, 20 a year. And we haven't had them for over two years. So this is us sort of thumbing our nose back at the darkness as we do in Jesus. But now we're going to do it as we get stuffed. So we're going to take communion. Communion will be served up front here. This will be the conclusion of our service. And then please head over, head over to the, you could eat outside, come back out here, whatever, but head over yonder to pick up the food uh, in the church, in the building of the church. So Holy Communion, we remember 
in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, he took bread. The night before his death, he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. And after supper was ended, he took the cup, he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink. And he said, this cup is the new Testament, the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So do this in memory of me. So uh, Emmanuel, let's stand together and let's pray the prayer that our Lord and Savior taught his disciples, taught his friends, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, after you receive communion, as I mentioned, please head over to the gym. And this, this now concludes our service after you receive Holy Communion. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his never-ending peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.